Good morning and welcome to worship here at Earl Street Baptist Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us again this Sunday morning. Today is Sunday, July the 19th, which means we're about halfway through our summer sermon series entitled Kingdom People, Scenes from Matthew's Gospel. Stephen will be bringing our message this morning and the title of his sermon is Don't Blame the Preacher. As we move into our time of worship, let us ask God to open our eyes, our ears, our heart, and our mind for the message that he has for us today through the sermon. And remember, whatever you do, don't blame the preacher. Lord, most of the time, the problem is not your lack of speaking to us, but our lack of listening to you. Forgive us our many distractions. Forgive us for turning attention to everything and everyone but you. Forgive us for ignoring what we know you have said to us already and help us to hear the voice that never stops seeking out our hearts so that it might rest and nest there. Lord, we have come to hear you. Speak to us now. Amen. Somebody's knocking at your door. 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 Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Can't you hear him? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Sounds like Jesus. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus calls you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking. Somebody's knocking. Somebody's knocking at your door. Good morning. Before we pray this morning, I am excited to let you know that we will be gathering in person outdoors for worship beginning Sunday, July 26th. We will meet at Paris View Baptist Church here in Greenville, where there's plenty of room to spread out in a shady space and be together with appropriate social distancing outside. We're going to meet on Sunday evenings beginning July 26th at 6.30 p.m., there at Paris View, and there will be singing and praying and teaching and worshiping God together, which we have missed so much. We'll do our best to make it safe, but make it as joyful as possible. So please come join us if you feel like it, and we would love to see you there. And now let's go into our time of prayer together. This week, I would like for us to, to go to the scriptures for a model prayer. Early on in the pandemic, we talked about lament and pouring out our concerns and our troubles and even our complaints to God and how the biblical model of lament goes from pouring out our troubles to demonstrating our faith 
working through our trust in God and ending up with hope and praise. And so much of the Psalms uh, takes that approach. And I'd like to pray today from Psalm 102, which I think is very appropriate uh, for where we are and how so many of us are feeling. But as always, even when we don't have the words, God gives them to us. So join me as we pray together through Psalm 102. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea. Don't turn away from me in my time of distress. Bend down to listen and answer me quickly when I call to you. For my days disappear like smoke and my bones burn like red hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I have lost my appetite. Because of my groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. I'm like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely as a solitary bird on the roof. My enemies taunt me day after day. They mock and curse me. I eat ashes for food. My tears run down into my drink because of your anger and wrath. For you have picked me up and thrown me out. My life passes as swiftly as the evening shadows. I am withering away like grass. But you, O oh Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure to every generation. You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem. And now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promised to help. For your people love every stone in her walls and cherish even the dust in her streets. Then the nations will tremble before the Lord. The kings of the earth will tremble before his glory. For the Lord will rebuild Jerusalem he will appear in his glory. He will listen to the prayers of the destitute. He will not reject their pleas. Let this be recorded for future generations so that a people not yet born will praise the Lord. Tell them the Lord looked down from his heavenly sanctuary. He looked down to earth from heaven to hear the groans of the prisoners to release those condemned to die. And so the Lord's fame will be celebrated in Zion, his praises in Jerusalem, when multitudes gather together and kingdoms come to worship the Lord. He broke my strength in midlife, cutting short my days. But I cried to him, Oh my God, who lives forever, don't take my life while I am so young. Long ago, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them. But you are always the same. You will live forever. The children of your people will live in security their children's children will thrive in your presence. Let this be our prayer today, dear God. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then verses 18 through 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. 
When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown among the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Am I preaching if no one is listening? Some of you are saying, what did he say? So for those of you who were not listening the first time, let me ask you again. Am I preaching if no one is listening? Or does it take at least two people to preach? Fred Craddock tells us of a time when he was preaching at a church in Atlanta and following the service, the minister was supposed to take Dr. Craddock out to lunch, but before they went to lunch, the minister said, um, if you don't mind, I need to take a few minutes and kind of clean up the sanctuary before we leave. So Fred Craddock offered to help the minister pick up the bulletins while he was waiting on the pastor to take him to lunch. And as he was picking up the bulletins, he picked up this one particular bulletin, and on the side where the announcements were, there was writing. In one handwriting, it said, Do you want to close the deal today? And in another handwriting, it said, On Sunday? Question mark. And then in the first handwriting underneath, it said, But if we don't close it today, we may lose it. And Fred Craddock said that seeing that bulletin that day was just a vivid reminder to him that not everyone is sitting spellbound, clinging to the preacher's every word as you are right now. You think you're up there proclaiming the eternal truth of God and somebody back in the sanctuary is closing a deal. I remember going to my first preaching class in seminary and the preaching professor, who was one of the dearest people I've ever known, said something like this. This semester you will be studying the discipline of preaching. You will be studying how Jesus preached, how Paul preached, how Peter preached. You will be reading some of the classics in the field of homiletics. You will be studying the history of preaching. You will watch and hear on tape some of the most gifted preachers of our time. You will preach before each other and will gently critique each other's sermons. You will discover your own preaching style and you will develop your own approach to preparing and delivering sermons. But be sure you know this, he said. Most of the people listening, listening to you preach on Sunday morning are never going to bother to take a course on how to listen to a sermon. Many times you're going to be up there pouring your heart and soul into your sermon. You may have poured your heart and soul into the preparation of it. And then when you deliver it to your congregation as a gift to the congregation, Many of them are just going to give you this blank stare, count the minutes till it's over, and leave unaffected by what you have said. Most of them are just going to show up and give some kind of casual reaction to your sermon. And if your sermon flops, they're going to blame you. And sometimes they will have every right to blame you, but sometimes... When the sermon flops, it's not going to be your fault. You might get blamed for it, but it won't always be your fault. Sometimes, he said, people will disregard or reject your message not because you don't know how to preach, but because they don't know how to listen. 
I thought at first that those words seemed a bit cynical, that the professor was not giving the congregation enough credit. But now that I've been doing this kind of work for 40 years, I realize that my professor was more right than I thought at first. It's not that you are bad people, but with all due respect, sometimes I wonder what good any of my sermons do. Regularly, Sylvia will tell you this, I walk away from the preaching task and ask myself, what good did that do? So often, nothing seems to happen. And so I find myself regularly fantasizing about something else I could do with my life. I've always thought I could be a good meter reader, but I didn't pursue that, but I thought I could, at least if I were a meter reader, I could look back and tell that I did something. Nobody knows better than I do that some sermons, some sermons flop because they're bad sermons. Some of my sermons, I know, they, they, they never really quite take off. Some of my sermons flop because they never find a good landing place. And the preacher has to, has to assume a certain share of responsibility in this preaching task. A lot of responsibility, as a matter of fact. But here's what I want you to know. We're in this preaching thing together. And I'm often reminded that some people didn't even like Jesus' sermons. There is an art to hearing the Word of God, just as there is an art to preaching it. On several occasions, Jesus concluded his sermon with these words, Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Paul taught that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But not everybody who has ears to hear, hears. The Gospel of Matthew is built around five long discourses or sermons by Jesus. The first in chapters 5 through 7 is by far the most familiar. It's the sermon that we now call the Sermon on the Mount. The second of these sermons is found in chapter 10 where Matthew records that Jesus commissioned and instructed the 12 disciples before he sent them out. And we have been looking at excerpts from that passage in recent weeks. The third of these long discourses can be found in chapter 13, which begins with the parable of the sower that we just read. Now next week, we're going to look at the next parable in this chapter, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Jesus was fond of using these agricultural parables because any ordinary Galilean farmer would have been able to relate to these parables easily. That is to say, Jesus took into account the circumstances and life experiences of his listeners, which is something every good preacher does. Now, to a modern wheat or barley farmer, it may seem a bit strange that farmers in that time sowed before they plowed. But the farmer in this parable was doing just that. Jesus said that first, he sowed seeds along the path which villagers had hardened by their traveling back and forth on that same path as they made their way across the field. And of course, these seeds would just remain exposed and were not very likely to be covered. Therefore, a high percentage of them would be lost to the birds hunting for sustenance. Other seed, he said, fell on rocky ground, germinated rapidly just below the surface, but could not produce lasting roots because of the rocks underneath the, the topsoil. Some seed was cast among thorns. And by the time the weed or barley came up, it became choked out by these unwanted thorns. But fortunately, 
Some seed fell into good soil, was productive, and yielded a great harvest. End of story. Now that seems like a harmless enough parable. But the way Jesus ends the parable gives us a clue as to why he was telling it. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. After Jesus told this parable to the crowds, the disciples took him aside and asked what the parable meant. By asking the question, the disciples were demonstrating an openness to Jesus' message, a curiosity about what he had taught. And so Jesus responded by interpreting the parable for them, something he did not always do. In Matthew's account of interpretation, the sower himself is not explicitly identified and neither is the seed. But from the rest of the explanation, it is clear that the seed is the word of the kingdom, the word of the rule and reign of God, the truth of scripture, the power of the gospel. The seed is the word of God, the word of the kingdom. And the sower is anyone who spreads that word. It doesn't have to be a professional preacher, though often it is. But the sower and the seed are not identified explicitly because clearly the weight and thrust of this parable is not upon the sower or the seed, but upon the soil upon which the seed falls. That is, the life and the heart and the mind of the listener. And according to this parable, there are several different kinds of soil upon which the seed may fall. See if you find yourself in one of these descriptions. The first is likened to the hardened path. There are some people, let's face it, who are like a hard path. The word of the kingdom hardly gets there, and then it is gone. There's no understanding. The evil one, like a sparrow, comes and snatches away the seed that was sown before there was time for it to germinate. These are not necessarily bad people. It's just that they have been hardened by the experiences of life, sometimes by bad experiences at a particular church, sometimes by bad experiences with a certain preacher or with religion in general. And somehow they just have a bad taste in their mouths for matters of faith. Some of them have become cynical about matters of faith because of the abuses of religion that they see everywhere they turn. Some of them have unresolved anger or bitterness that has nothing to do with the preacher. It's just that the preacher is the easy target. But with some people, there is a dullness and a hardness in their hearts that makes it hard for the seed to take root. It's one of the saddest things you will ever see. Someone who has become so hardened by life that it seems humanly impossible to penetrate the thick shell under which they hide. Some seed, Jesus said, falls on shallow soil. There's not much depth, and underneath the top inch of soil is rock. The seed springs up. Everyone is excited. So-and-so has just come back from camp, or so-and-so has just come back from a mission trip, or so-and-so has just been to a concert or a retreat, or so-and-so has just made a profession of faith and has joined the church. So-and-so has just been baptized and he or she is all fired up. It's all very exciting at first. And then what happens? Well, we really don't know what happens except that there was just no depth. We're not talking about insincerity here. We're just talking about shallowness. Shallow people are just doing what feels good at the moment. They are an inch deep and a mile long. They might receive the word with joy because they're caught up in the moment, but somehow 
It just never takes root in their lives. And the very first time life gets hard, the very first time that persecution or tribulations come their way, they fall away. Jesus said sometimes the word of God falls among thorns. These are good people, but they just have too many irons in the fire, too many things to do. They have just said yes to too many things. Oh, they come to church every now and then, but it's just kind of like a cameo appearance. They're on the stage and then off again. They once had a list of priorities, but they lost the list. And now it's just a matter of where the most pressure is felt. And so you hear them saying something like this. I would have been there, but my cousin called and asked me to meet her in commerce to pick out a dress to wear to the class reunion. Or they might say something like, I know my child is ready to be baptized and we'll try to get that scheduled as soon as dance class is over. We'll work it in. These people have good intentions. They have excellent potential. They hear the word, but they do not remain focused on it. The word is somehow crowded out by the thorns of material concerns. And then before they know it, they get, so caught up in all those other things and all of those priorities get old and they never realize that they never got around to nourishing their spirits and praying and reading the scripture and thinking about what really matters in life. But then Jesus said there's the good soil. The seed that falls on the good soil. Now this good soil is a mystery to me how it all happens because these people who are the good soil people, they live in the same world everybody else lives in. They've had some of the same kinds of bad experiences with church and religion and preachers. They've had some of the same friends and work at some of the same places, but somehow Somehow, they have not become hardened. They have not become embittered. They have not become distracted. They have received the word, and the more they receive, the more they long for it. They can't get enough of it. They have a hunger to hear it again and again. They are genuine, true, humble, serving Christians who make a difference in their world, who take time to nourish their souls and produce much fruit. The seed takes root in their lives and they live productive, fruitful lives. They rarely, if ever, hear a bad sermon because they are such good hearers, they can always find a word from God. They can always find something of worth despite the limitations of the message or the messenger. There are various ways of hearing the word, not all of them good. The problem with so many sermons is not the word itself. And the problem with so many sermons is not always even the one who proclaims it. The problem with a lot of sermons is the one who is hearing it. In this parable, the problem is not the seed. It's not the one planting it. It's the soil upon which it falls. So don't blame the preacher until you first examine yourself. Then you can blame the preacher if you want to or need to. And you might. I can tell you that no sermon does quite what the preacher hoped it would do. But I can also tell you this, that when a biblical sermon is bathed in prayer, 
and it is sown upon good soil, it is amazing what can happen. A sermon is only as good as its hearers. So if you have ears to hear, Jesus said, hear the word, receive it with joy, let it take deep root in your heart and mind so that you may bear much fruit and glorify the one from whose heart the seed came. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, Christ our Savior, and the Holy Spirit our Comforter be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.